Today, we need to open up our Bibles. Joshua, we'll start there in chapter 2 today. And as you turn there, I want to share with you uh, an opportunity I had over the last week, right before the men's retreat. I had met with Edward Amaya, and if some of you guys I know were here when Far Reaching Ministries came, and the big thing with Far Reaching Ministries is they have been an enabler of the gospel to go into uh, communities and nations which, well, are severely persecuted. Uh, this is a ministry that is largely sponsored by many uh, Calvary chapels within the country, and their primary, original focus was there in the Sudan. Uh, over the last probably 10 years, God has opened the door for them to serve missionaries in over 28 different highly persecuted nations. Uh, part of their team is, um, I got to meet with Edward, uh, he's a part of their ghost operations, which means that he is responsible for those missionaries that are in really difficult places, places where uh, lives could be lost and lives are lost. Uh, and as he was sharing with me, um, they've had a, a pretty big uh, responsibility. As many of you guys know, uh, Afghanistan, well, um, America pulled their troops out, and an absolute atrocity took place, an atrocity in which we haven't seen in many, many years as it relates to just an overwhelming sense of, of religious persecution. And, 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 and not to get into all the, the, the really bad political decisions and all the things that, that happened there, but the reality of it is, is that it was an absolute disaster. I mean, it could not have gone worse. And who did it go worse or the worst for? I mean, obviously, we lost a whole bunch of Marines, right, that were there trying to get Americans and, and other people who are highly persecuted who supported uh, the United States through, uh, through that season, and we lost a lot of people through suicide bombers. Um, but those who are being persecuted the greatest is the church. The moment that it happened, he shared a few stories, and, and the reason why he's, he's so familiar with this, um, with, with what's going on there is that they have, you know, worked with and, and continue to support several missionaries in that area. And, um, and so what they're looking to do is, is they're looking to find ways to get these key individuals, these Christians, these Christian families, these, you know, that they know of and aware of. There's about 3,000 of them uh, that they've been able to identify clearly. Uh, they've got to get them out of the country. And... Um, I can't go into all the details because he asked me not to share them publicly on anything, uh, but a big part of what is going on is trying to identify ways to be able to get them out. And some of the, one of the stories that he shared, which was absolutely devastating, I'll share two of them actually. Um, the first one was is that there's a lady who had been uh, taking care of, of young, uh, young Afghani women, and she's a missionary there, and she had this overwhelming sense of the Spirit making it clear she needed to destroy all the records of all the girls who had ever been through her ministry. And this was the day before the United States announced they were going to be withdrawing troops. And so she obeyed and was obedient. And then that very next day, um, as soon as the withdrawal took place and the Taliban took over, uh, they came to her door knowing that if they could understand where these young ladies have then eventually been sent, that they could start to find other Christians in the country to be able to kill. Um, they were able to find ways to get uh, this lady uh, and a handful of these girls in hiding. Um, they currently are still in hiding, and they're working with, uh, uh, with some mercenaries, honestly, to get them out. And so a pretty incredible experience of what's going on there. Um, one family that they met in a, in a bordering country um, was just a lady, her four-year-old daughter, um, and her, I believe it's like a nine to, to 12-year-old daughter. Um, the, the lady's uh, brother-in-law was a part of the Taliban, one of the key leaders in whatever region that they were in. And the moment that, uh, that they heard what was happening, um, 
and they had a chance to go persecute. They, the, the leader ended up going into the home of this lady and her husband, um, and in front of the family, some really bad things happened to the husband, in which he was then killed. Um, and they ended up doing some really obscene things with the girls and the mother, uh, and eventually uh, took one of the daughters to be married over and over and over and used until they were kind of all used up. And so uh, they somehow escaped and, and now have a way to kind of a pathway to safety. Uh, but there's, there's um, a ton of persecution that's even going on in her home where they found ways to get in touch with her and said, we're going to kill all of your immediate family if you don't come back. Um, of course, they would kill their immediate family even if she did come back. And so there's a lot of persecution going on. Um, as a church, we're praying about how we might be able to support that. But I share that because this is something that will ultimately come to this world as a whole. This is a season where we have been able to receive glimpses in parts of our world of absolute evil. And I look at that, and, and first, of th- first of all, I know we need to pray. Right As a church, we do need to be praying for the persecuted church and those who are going out there to be able to do something about it. Um, and, and so that's something that we as a church will continue to do along with supporting uh, some of the work that Far Reaching Ministries does uh, as well. Uh, but what's in, what I'm getting at, though, is that what's really important is that this will only increase the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't say all of that to be fear-mongering, right, or to scare anybody, but what it should do is, is it should draw about a sensitivity that, that the end is going to come because we know this sense of lawlessness will rise up. And as we go through the Word of God today, what we're going to get to discover is one of those treasures in Scripture that's going to point to a time that is still yet to come, even though we're here in the book of Joshua. right? And and one of those key things that we know is going to happen is that Jesus is going to return. You know, just as important as Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and his ascension into heaven is going to be his imminent return. For anybody who doesn't hold fast to that belief, and assurance that Jesus will come back to eventually establish his kingdom, they haven't read the scripture. They're on a completely different pathway. They're believing in the wrong Jesus. And so this is such a critical event, it just hasn't happened yet. And so as we go through the scripture today, we're going to get this amazing glimpse This amazing illustration, as we've been talking about the book of Joshua, as being an illustrator of New Testament principles. right? I mean, we get to look back and we get to see how the Lord had worked with the nation of Israel to be able to go in and conquer the promised land. A big common theme in which we've been driving and pushing has really been on what does it look like to have that abundant, promise-filled life of being led by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? As they crossed over the River Jordan, they're filled with the Spirit, is what it relates to for us. And then now having to go through battle after battle, but all the while experiencing the promises of God as the Spirit of God would work through the people rather than just kind of working around and for the people. It's an amazing picture, and we'll continue as we go through the book of Joshua, marching through many of those principles that we'll discover Today, we're going to get to take a step and we're going to see an illustration of things to come. We get to discover one of those treasures, as you would be able to find in in Proverbs 2, 4 through 5. It would say this, If you seek her as silver and search her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. As Solomon would tell us, search the Scriptures. Seek out the treasure that you're going to be able to find here in the Word of God. That this would be something that we would study, that we would know, that we would be able to to continue to grow in. And as you get into the Scripture, today we're going to get to see one of those treasures that if you just kind of read through it without studying or without being able to have a broader picture of, of the things to come, you'd miss this awesome treasure that we're going to get to discover in the Scripture today as it relates to things to come. 
And to give you a little bit of background as we get into the book of Joshua, we've covered so far all the way up to Joshua chapter 7. But starting there in in chapter 2, we find that as the the Israelites have crossed over into the Jordan, or actually, sorry, before they crossed over the River Jordan, they sent spies to go into the land and be able to spy out what would be their first obstacle when they get into the promised land. They send these two spies in, and they go to Jericho. It was a well-fortified city. They had had two walls um, that were built around the city, who was actually then built upon a hill, which would have made it one of the most fortified cities in the region. It was a key hub for trade. It was incredibly important from a, a military perspective, a commerce perspective. But what we find is, is that as they go into this town, well, word gets out that they're there. And so they go and stay at Rahab's house, who Rahab, well, you know, she was a harlot. Right? And so we know that she had people in and out of her place all of the time. That was her trade. That's what she did. She spent her life, well, doing things for other people that, well, really become sin. So it's a sinful lifestyle in which they go and they stay in this lady's house. And we start to hear them sharing with Rahab some of the things that have happened. These two spies, well... They weren't just spies, but they became witnesses. Witnesses that are proclaiming the good things that God has done. We know that she would protect them, save them from being, well, captured by those there in Jericho. And by that, was her, you know, her faith was accounted to her. And so here we are. We're in verse 8 of chapter 2. I'm going to start reading there. It says this. Now, before they lay down, She came up to them on the roof. So she hid them on the roof. She put flax over them, hood them on the roof, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and the terror has fallen upon us, that the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard of how the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since you have shown me kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father my mother, my brothers, my sisters, that they may have, and all that they may have, and deliver our lives from death. And she, she said, uh, and then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide them there three days, or hide there three days until the pursuers have returned Afterward, you may go your way. So as we get this picture of Rahab, we get to see a glimpse of what it is to be, well, us. We ourselves are much like Rahab, caught in a situation where we're living, well, in a place that that has rejected the Lord. They've rejected God, just as we live today in a Christ-rejecting world. And as a result of that, we ourselves have been caught up in that same level of rejection, ultimately until we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. Meaning that we would go after any and all other gods, any and all other things in which we would allow ourselves to have our affection set towards, rather than what would be right, true, and holy. We ourselves were like Rahab, weren't we? We had all gone down in those paths. Some of you may be there even today. We've been down those roads. And what have we found? I believe just as Rahab would have found, there wasn't hope. There wasn't this idea that there would be safety and security living there in this world in the same way that that world would go until then she heard the good news of those two witnesses. 
She got to hear the proof and the truth that something really happened. That all these sort of stories of of God's goodness and graciousness towards the children of Israel, they're true. I finally got to see somebody who got to not only experience it, but they live by faith because of it. Something changed in her. She starts to now say, this is the Lord God. She's radically changed by it. And then she had had said, she said, listen, in verse 12, as I read, therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all they have, and deliver our lives from death. Is there something that can be done for my family? Is there something that can be done for me? In light of all the things in which are coming, an absolute understanding of destruction that's going to come upon Jericho because of all the things in which we've seen in the past, is there something that could be done for Rahab? Something that could possibly be done for her family. Is there any way that she herself might be able to be saved? Turn with me, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. You'll see a rather familiar story. Here we're going to get to discover, well, a time when Paul and Silas, they had been proclaiming the gospel, and unfortunately, they had messed up somebody's business because a fortune-telling girl had been converted. Here we are in verse 25, they were thrown in jail, and it says this, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awaking, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What should I do to be saved? What do we see here? God sends two men into a fortified place. These men were called to be witnesses as they were singing praises and everybody's hearing them there in the prison. There's one man who's been caught kind of stuck dealing with a place that was severely sinful. Now in a position where he knows that his destruction is going to be imminent and it's coming has to come face to face with the reality. What must I do to be saved? And so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. How cool is this? An amazing parallel. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And now he had brought them into the house, set before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. Just as she would have sent Joshua, not Joshua, um, the two spies out into the wilderness to protect them, to save them, this jailer cleaned up the wounds. And then the whole family ultimately was saved. 
You see, what an amazing New Testament picture of what's going on with us. What must they do to be saved? They must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your household. There was no other commentary. There was no longer, if you do this, this, and this. It was simple. The message would be simple. Just as the message would be simple there for Rahab. So what do they say? Go back to Joshua chapter 2. As you get there, we have to kind of think about Rahab. She's saying this, what must we basically be, what must we do to be saved? How can my family be spared? How can I be spared? What is it that she needed to be spared from? Well, the obvious, right? The obvious is, is that destruction would be coming, right? That the nation of Israel was coming to be able to take out Jericho, this sinful city. So for her, she knew that destruction would certainly be coming because finally, Jericho would be judged for their sin. But was that it? Was that all that she needed to be saved from? For Rahab, she lived a life in sin, didn't she? She was stuck living in a world of sin. The immorality she had walked in, the lifestyle that was riddled with pain, fear of what would come next, the constant in and out of those who would come into her home, only there to use her past regrets, those would all be things in which she would also have desired to be saved from. And so when we sit there and we look and we wonder, well, what is it that we truly are saved from? So many times we might hear the gospel and it says, have you been saved? Well, what's the question? Well, I mean, what am I saved from? I know as I was an unbeliever, what am I saved from? My life's going okay. Things seem to be lining up. I've got a plan for my life. I'm moving down a path. What in the world do I need to be saved from? Well, I needed one to be saved from destruction because my sin would separate me from a loving, holy God, which would ultimately lead to my judgment. But I also didn't realize I needed to be saved from the sin or from the Christ-rejecting world in which I lived in for my sin that would be destructive to me, as well as the things that would happen inside of me as people would sin against me. Do you realize that when you're sitting here and you say that you're saved, what are you really saved from? What are you saved from? Does your life look as though you've been saved from something? Because if somebody is saved from absolute destruction, their life is going to be incredibly grateful and thankful and likely going to change so that they wouldn't walk that same path yet again. (laughs) That they wouldn't. And so for her, what must she do? What should she do to be saved? There in verse 17, it would say this, So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of a scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brother, and all your father's household into your home. And so it shall be that whoever goes out of the doors of your house and into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. Our hand is laid upon him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from this oath in which you made us swear. What should she do? Well, it was the same thing the jailer needed to do. 
she would have to put her faith in something. And in this case, it would have been a scarlet cord. A scarlet cord, one that would be, well, dyed the color of blood, that she would hang outside of her window, which would have reminded us clearly of the day of Passover, right? In which God had said judgment would be coming for all those who did not choose to put their faith in the blood of the Lamb that is put on the doorpost there on Passover. And just as they put their faith in the blood of the Lamb, she herself would put her faith in a representation thereof as well, just as we ourselves must do. And so now she's done that, right? She clearly, immediately, when you see at the very kind of end of that, um, then she said, according to your words it shall be, and she sent them away, and, de- and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Immediately, she did that. So now, what is her job for the next how long? Now, mind you, Rahab doesn't know Joshua chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. She has no idea. She didn't get the, you know, tomorrow's newspaper. So she has no idea. What is she going to do now? What is her job? What is Rahab's number one responsibility now? She came out of a life of sin. She came out of a, you know, she's now the crazy one who's saying, listen, I've just put my faith in this God of Israel. How do you even know the God of Israel? Who talked to you? Well, let me tell you the story. It's incredible. So her job for who knows how long is to make sure that her family and those she loves and she cares for is going to do the same thing she did and put the blood or put her trust in what represents the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. That she needs to get him in the household so that they might be safe. Okay, so that's clearly our job right now in this season of our life, which We should be dedicated, focused on continuously sharing our faith. Ready to go, ready to bring as many people as we possibly can. So now as we continue to look forward, what do you think Rahab's looking for when destruction comes? How is she going to know that destruction might come in an instant? when the attack might actually take place there on Jericho. What is she waiting for? She's waiting for the Jordan River to stop and for this big flood of Israelites to come into the promised land. She's waiting for the nation of Israel to come into the promised land. Because when they come into the promised land, that's an understanding of when she would ultimately, that city and that entire region would end up facing some level of destruction. Just as we must look for and look back to, thankfully now, we know that pending judgment will come on a a Christ-rejecting world the moment that the nation of Israel comes back into the promised land. Just as Isaiah 66 would tell us, verse 8, for God did not appoint us, that's not it. Why did I copy and paste that one wrongly? Turn with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, there in verse 8. You notice this is the very last chapter in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 books in it, and it has a similar structure to it as the entirety of the Bible. And so it's very important to understand that because there in the very last chapter, we're getting to get a view of end-time prophecy. And so it says this there in verse 8, it says, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing that shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born in once? 
For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Just as we got to see what the nation of Israel going through their most severe persecution there in World War II, which would be likened to great labor, that God brought forth a nation in one day, May 14, 1948, which gives us a point in time to look back to and say, wow, we know that the time must be near because the nation of Israel has entered in to the promised land. Have they captured the full promises of God? At this point, have they given their hearts over to Jesus Christ? No. Has the nation of Israel, as they crossed over the Jordan, captured the promised land at this point? Not a chance. Not yet. And so what would have been her promise? That when judgment would come, that she would not be, well, caught up in it. Her promise was, is that they would give her a token or it would have been a payment or understanding, you know, some sign. And the sign would have been the scarlet cord. Just as those who are followers of Jesus Christ, well, we ourselves, because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, we would not experience the judgment of God. But rather, we would find ourselves so, taken out, just as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 would say, For God did not appoint us to wrath. Who's he talking to? He's not talking about Israel. He is talking about the believers in Christ. You Gentiles, you and me, that we are not appointed to wrath, that we are not going to be going through the destruction, but rather we'll be taking out of the destruction destruction, but unto salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we should live together with him. What is our token? Our token is the blood of the lamb that was shed there on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ. That is the very thing, our salvation, in which we hold so tightly and dearly to, which would give us a confident hope in which we would not face the wrath that is to come. Now get this, that doesn't mean we don't have a bunch of pre, you know, like pre-rapture sort of things that go on. That doesn't mean that believers in Afghanistan are going to be free from the, the sinful effects of this world as things continue to get worse. It just means that there's no longer going to be the wrath of God coming. And say, well, well, is it really the wrath of God that took place there on Jericho? What's interesting is, as you would, well, continue on as we get to see that, that Jesus, the commander of the Lord's army, would come, and he would meet with Joshua before they would go out to battle. We'll get into that in just a second. So what do you think Rahab should do? She knows judgment's coming. She knows that there's going to be this point in time in which Jericho will certainly fall. It has to. Their time clock is almost up. What should she do? Well, the first thing is, is that she should have great urgency, shouldn't she? What do you think you do if you're Rahab and you just met two guys who came to tell you that we're going to come destroy the city and that God is real and you've put your faith in him? Now, what are the first things she's going to do? She's going to go share with her family and make sure that they're in the house, isn't she? That's a sense of urgency. Why? Because she has no idea the timing. No clue when it's actually going to come. So therefore, she's constantly going to be put, pressing in to make sure that those who she loves are going to be able to come into the household of faith. That would be her logical response. How would she do that? Just one more person at a time. Just one person. She'd go to her mother. She'd go to her father. She'd go to her brother. She'd go to her sisters, her sister-in-law. Anybody else that, that would be willing to listen to this lady who once lived in sin but has now put her faith in Jesus Christ, she's likely going to tell. This is a sense of urgency. Just one person at a time. God's grace is moving in that community. It's moving there in Jericho, albeit very small and albeit maybe very tight. 
it is moving and God's grace is being found in a sin-loving world. That's amazing. So there should be a sense of urgency with us. A legitimate sense of urgency because we don't know the day and the hour. We know that He will come as though a thief in a night when everybody proclaims peace and safety. Then He'll be there. Then nobody will be able to predict it nor figure it out. Don't try. Don't listen to anybody who does. I can tell you it's in the future. It's a time to come. What also would that have done to a, well, a lady like Rahab? Do you think she continued on living in the same patterns of life in which she had before? Could you imagine? Not a chance. She would make herself ready for the day when her salvation would be completed. Where it was no longer simply by faith, but rather experienced by sight. She'd wait for that moment, but she would keep herself pure. Just as Jesus would share that, ter- that parable, where he said, the kingdom of God is like ten virgins. Ten, pe- ten ladies who were preparing for the bridegroom. Bridegroom showed up, but the problem was is that five were ready. Five were not. And the five that were not ready were not able to meet the bridegroom. Because they needed to have oil in their lampstands, which should be likened to the Holy Spirit. How are we prepared and ready for that moment? Is that we should have the Holy Spirit working inside of us, filled with the Holy Spirit, walking further and further away from our sin, purifying our hearts before the Lord, allowing those ways of of sinful lifestyles to just, well, be of the past and walk in a level of holiness where we're ready at any instant. You know, I can imagine, and, and, and I'm even convicted, how many times in the last week would I have been radically ashamed if the Lord would have just simply appeared at that moment in that instant? Whether the, the deceitfulness of my heart or my actions is just fully on display or just wrangling on the inside. No, there should be a sense of purity as we prepare and make sure that we ourselves are ready. And so as Joshua crosses over into the promised land, we see that he did get instructions, well, from the Lord. Right there in chapter 5, verse 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite of him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. Such an important key. Go listen to the message. It's huge. But as the commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. I am now in control. I am now directing and guiding everything that's about to happen. Joshua, you're no longer going to be putting together some incredible military plan. You're not going to put the game plan together and say, okay, boys, let's get it done. No, I, Jesus, we know that this would be Jesus because here he falls on his face and worships him and says, what does the Lord say to his servant? In the Old Testament, every time in which we would see this this worship take place, and it not, and it's certainly from the Lord, and it's not like rejected, like when the angel would come and people would fall on their face, they say, get up. In this case, it's not the case. The worship is received. He says, what is it that you want me to do? What shall I do? And so at this point, Jesus is in absolute and total control. So he gives them this instruction. We'll jump there in chapter two, or chap, sorry, chapter six, verse two. It says this. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and its mighty men of valor, and you shall march around the city, all the men of war, and you shall go around the city once, and you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets 
of the ram's horns and you and before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priest shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpets, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So we get to get some of the instructions of now how this battle would ultimately ensue over a period of time. Notice, they're right there at the edge of Jericho. Destruction has yet to take place. We see here that he's going to send the Ark of the Covenant into this battle, which is not normal, which is not typical. We see later on that Saul tried to do this, and he got in a lot of trouble. And so they would then march around the city for seven days. And then seven times that final day, there would be seven priests carrying seven horns. It's important to note these were not your typical battle horns. These would have been your shofar. We can see that, you know, in the book, I believe it's Deuteronomy, where they talk about the horns that are made out of silver, right? Those would have been the the horns that would have proclaimed charge or announcement for battle. But instead, these horns would be used to call people to worship. Call them to worship. And then there would be a great shout when the final trumpet had been sounded, and then the walls would fall, and eventually Rahab and her family would be, well, taken out of that destruction. So what does all this mean? Why is it that this is such an important kind of process as we look forward into the things to come? Now, the first thing we see there is that the ark. Why would they have the ark marching around this city for seven days? Well, because the ark represents salvation. So where do you get that? Well, let's go back to the first ark. There in the days of Noah. You realize when he built the ark, right, a large boat, the idea there was is that this would be for the salvation of all of the people as God would ultimately judge a sinful world. Sound familiar? Absolutely. So as the floods came, what did the ark do? The ark brought the family of Noah up, caught them up, and their family was ultimately saved because they were the only ones who were found righteous. Just as we would have seen, well, Moses. He was placed in a teeny tiny little ark, right? As a baby who was caught up there in Egypt in a place where sin was designed to to destroy young babies. And so he was placed in this tiny little ark, sent down the river, ultimately leading to his salvation, an opportunity to be raised up as the leader of the Israelite people that would lead them out. And therefore, as he was led out, he was given the, the opportunity to build what is known as the Ark of the Covenant. This wasn't a floating ark, but the idea there was is it has the same understanding, that, that the ark would represent the salvation of God's people. Not only would it give them the law, but it would also give them the provision, right? As you would have the law in the ark, you would have the manna that would be there, you'd also have the the, the staff of Aaron that would have budded, would have been in the ark as well. So all of that would represent salvation. And here we see that the ark would be carried by the priests, walking around the city, over and over and over, putting on display to the city the salvation that is found there through the ark. It would be paraded around, just as we should be parading around Jesus Christ everywhere we should go. We should be demonstrating and and showing that God is patient with them. You see, for six days, destruction, or seven days, destruction was imminent. God's grace and salvation. God's grace and salvation. God's grace and salvation. Around and around and around it would go. 
Rahab, when is this thing going to happen? When is destruction going to finally be there? I mean, when the, the, everything is looking as though it should be there, we're just waiting. And around it would go as the ark would be paraded around, showing and demonstrating the salvation. Who is our ark? It's Jesus Christ, in which we must be parading around a, a Christ-rejecting world, saying this is the only way for salvation. Then eventually, as they go around, you can see that there would be a great shout, a great proclamation, a great shout, and we know, well, at this point, Rahab would be taken to safety. The walls would fall, and it reminds us of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive will remain and shall be caught up. That's the word that we get rapture from in the Latin. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. With a great shout that happened. And in that moment, and in that scene, you know, Jesus was leading the procession. He was there guiding the troops. And so we get to see that, well, the commander of the Lord's army is ultimately one day going to come down. And with a great shout, proclamation, with the sound of a trumpet, we'll be caught up. This is a moment known as the rapture. As we look at end times, we see that the very next event that we have to happen is going to be the rapture. And after that, we'll proceed a season of seven years called the tribulation, which is broken up into two sides. The first half will be a season where there will actually be kind of a, a coming together of peace, world prosperity. There will still be judgment, but it will be a time where people will be quite thankful to live on this earth. Then immediately there will be a strong change, a strong wind of change, as the Antichrist would ultimately set himself up to become leader of the world there in the temple in Jerusalem that will eventually be built. And then we'll have three and a half years of absolute hell on earth. Those are the things to come. And then... The Lord will come back. He will come back and fight the battle of the Armageddon. It's not really a fight. He shouts. And there will be absolute destruction. Then he will judge all the nations based on how they would have related to Jesus Christ, how they would have supported the nation of Israel through this hard season. And then we'll have a thousand-year millennial kingdom. That gives us the big picture. And what's interesting is, as we look at that, we can dig deeper into this and we can see other parallels between now and the things to come. We see here that there are two witnesses, don't we? That those witnesses could be likened to the two witnesses found in Revelation chapter 3, who would go and they would proclaim the truth. They would eventually be killed for three and a half days and, and, and left there for dead, and then there would be life breathed back into them. How long were the two spies who became witnesses? They're in the wilderness. Three days. Interesting. Until they finally crossed over the River Jordan, and well, they made it back alive. We see the trumpets that will be blown throughout the book of Revelation pronouncing certain judgments and certain seasons of this time of tribulation. Right? And who are they blown by? Well, they're blown by angels. In this story, we see them blown by priests. The interesting thing about this is, is that those are actually trumpets that are made of silver and made of gold, not that of the shofar. There would be seven days of judgment that would be pronounced on Jericho as they walked around the city for seven days. 
Just as we know that, well, the tribulation would be seven years of judgment pronounced on the earth. We can see potentially that the seventh day, as they walked around the city seven times, this could possibly be the difference between, well, you know, the different judgments that God would have. These would be likely the bulls, which would be seen after the seventh trumpet was blown. And we know that Jesus will come with a great shout with all of his saints, leading to the battle of Armageddon. These are all interesting thoughts. And if you go down and you start to look all this up, you'll see maybe, possibly. But I'll tell you this. As we look at typologies, we have to be so careful that typologies don't create our doctrine. They don't create our doctrine. What are they designed to do? A typology is only designed to reinforce the doctrine in which we can find in Scripture. And so I, I struggle with some of those typologies, even though some of them may have some validity to them. Why? Because if you simply look at the Battle of Jericho, you miss the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua tells a story. Where does it start? The other side of the Jordan. Eventually they cross in. Then destruction will end up coming. We know that they were also called to prepare themselves to ready themselves through circumcision, to kind of have those things prepared and have those things ready by instituting the rules and the rituals that were given to them by Moses, which is exactly what we see happening now in Israel amongst the most orthodox of Jews as they're preparing themselves for a day in which they might rightfully worship. We also get to see that, as I shared, that Jesus, well, he becomes the commander of the Lord's army. And he opened up the door of a season of grace to the people there of Jericho, offering and displaying the ark of salvation to them over and over and over and over, giving a potential for them to finally, along with Rahab, hang out a rope of faith so that they themselves might be saved. Eventually, we see this season ends. When? In an instant. In a moment, in a flash of an eye, in a twinkling of an eye. It happens all at once. We can see and understand that the church is much like Rahab, a repentant sinner, who has put her faith in Jesus Christ and, well, was taken out of the judgment. Didn't have to go through the judgment that was there. And this is one of the biggest reasons why I say that you got to look at the whole book. What happens after the battle of Jericho? The defeated Ai. The defeated Ai. If we simply looked at the battle of Jericho, then we would understand the walls falling as being the battle of Armageddon, the final battle. We don't lose the final battle or anything thereafter, do we? No. But rather, what do we see? The moment that the nation, the, the, the moment that the church is caught up, the nation of Israel would face severe persecution. They would be sought to be obliterated without question. You know, what's also interesting is chapter 9 we would find that the Gibeonites, who were a nation that was not Israelite, we won't read it through there, who were not Israelites, would eventually put their faith into Yahweh. They themselves would not be considered Israelites, but they would give an, be given an opportunity known as the Nethanim. Okay? Not the Nephinim. The Nephinim is a little bit different. And what they got to do is, is they got to serve in a special capacity there in the temple of God. And we'll see them 
continuously spread throughout the gospel. They got to do, you know, they got to carry water and they got to cut wood to be able to serve in the temple of God, those Gibeonites who were kind of brought into the fold, just as we will know people will be saved during this season of the Great Tribulation. We also know that in chapter 10, there is going to be a king that will rise up. He is called the king of Jerusalem. His name is Adonai Zedek, which means king of righteousness. Well, but this king of righteousness would oppose the nation of Israel. He would oppose the nation of Israel and ultimately be judged for it. You know who also was called the king of righteousness? A man in the scripture by the name of Melchizedek. When Abraham had come into the promised land, he met this man Melchizedek, whose name literally means the king is righteousness. And we understand because of the book of Hebrews that Melchizedek is the highest order of priests. Therefore, Melchizedek is very likely Jesus Christ himself. So we see a symbol there in well, chapter 10 of the Antichrist, Adonai Zedek, who would oppose Israel, the king of Jerusalem, the king of righteousness, really? Well, not a chance. We would also see that for this season that we get to follow Joshua and his conquest of judging all of the nations that have rejected the Lord in the promised land, you know how long it would last? Just take a wild guess. Seven years. It would last for seven years. A little bit of work to get there. As it relates to I guess Deuteronomy chapter 2, and we get to see how long they wandered in the wilderness and how old Caleb was and eventually how old he was when they finished the conquest. But for seven years, judgment would be brought on all of the nations that were there in Israel. And finally, it would end in chapter 24, where God had kept His promises and had cleared out all of the nations among the people, and the people would declare God as their king. Just as we know, there will be a day and time when the Lord will reign for a thousand years, and all man will declare that God is king. Seals up the book of Joshua, giving us this amazing picture of the things to come. So for us, what must we do? Great information, Pastor. I don't do it for information's sake. I don't. I enjoy it. I hope you got to discover some treasures in the Word of God. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But what should we do? I want you guys to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. As you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul was telling the early church what they should do. Telling them what to do. And so we're going to take that as, well, for us to know what to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'll start there in verse 1. It says this, But concerning the times and the seasons... Brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. You don't need to know the signs, times and the seasons. I mean, Jesus had wrote about many of those, shared about those, and they've been written, and he'd also shared with them. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Not only will you have some understanding that signs could be there, but you'll never know the moment. You'll never know the time. Rahab wouldn't be able at any moment in time to say, hey guys, it's about to happen. Come on, get in the house. No, there's a sense of urgency because it could happen at any moment. At any point in time, this moment of rapture would happen because this is right after he talks about being caught up with the Lord. You don't know when that's going to happen. For when they say peace and safety, and then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. What do we see? Peace and safety are something that this world is actively striving for more than ever. And this is happening in such 
great ways, right? What are we doing? We are doing everything we can to transition all of the wars and all of the fighting between nations over to an invisible fight. Now, peace, I can't say is bad in and of itself, but we get to see a sign, a symbol that, that at some point, now we're walking, there's, there's this walking around, and I don't know how many times they have to go, it has to go around until it's there, but it's got to be getting close. How do we see that? Is that we've been shifting all of our attention to a different enemy. Well, it started with COVID, but as through COVID, our enemy has become an enemy that is completely invisible and doesn't fight back. It's one that we have been told is man-made and man-created. Whether it is or not, it doesn't really matter. But now our global fight is against climate change. And if the whole world can unite against one thing, we ought to unite against that. As I heard that little creepy girl from Sweden sharing, right? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. God, she is created in God's image. But as she, she, she would share, she's just like, what's going to happen with my kids and my grandkids if we don't get this thing together? I mean, it's all teleprompted and everything else, whatever. But here's the deal. The whole fight has been shifted over. Global tolerance has become the religion of the day. Not that tolerance is completely bad. Unless you're intolerant to people who have strong moral values. And that's been the other attack, is that if I can remove every moral position and every moral battle, moral like stance, what's right for you is great and what's right for me is fine too, then we don't ever have to be at odds, do we? We don't ever have to... F- there's, there's, there is... There, there could be then peace because you could have a completely way, different way of thinking and I'm accepting of that. The problem is, is that the Bible's clear. There is absolute truth. There are things that are clearly sin that are going to separate people from God. There is certainly a judgment coming on this Christ-rejecting world. I promise you that's going to happen. We can't play games with that. We can't get caught up in it. But that's the direction of our world. Where every man would do what he thought was right in his own eyes just as in the days of Noah, when destruction would come. Thankfully, guys, there's an ark, and that's Jesus Christ. We see a global economy, which is going to be absolutely necessary for one man to be able to control everything. Globalization is one of the key things in which shows us that the time is getting near. And what's been crazy about this is, is that the World Economic Forum has done such a great job at convincing every major corporation in the entire world to start to make adjustments. Well, why? Because as Americans, ah, we tend to kind of play this freedom card. Freedom of religion, freedom of what we speak and say, freedom of all these things. But you know how they can get to us? Our pocketbook. And so therefore, while they may not be able to legislate something, they can certainly control something. And that's going to be controlling it, everything from the morals in which we stand for, controlling it based on how much people make and try to level the playing field across the board, which in itself, like just taking little boxes, people can be like, oh, this is so bit, so what? So everything becomes such an incredibly unbelievable deal where you look at it, it's like, When in the world are you going to come back, Lord? How many times have you been walking around the city of Jericho showing the grace, and when does it finally come up? When does judgment finally have to hit? What must we do? First thing is, is we should watch. We must be watchful which would require us to live with an urgency and expectancy. Rahab sitting there at the, looking out her window through that scarlet cord would see judgment coming. And it would have only sped up her conversations. It would have only sped up one time around. Is it happening today? She has no idea. 
two times around. Seventh day, they keep marching and marching. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. It sounds a whole lot like labor pains, doesn't it? More frequent, more consistent. We must be sharing with an expectancy that it could happen in an instant. We must also be sober. Where do I get that? Continue reading on with me, 1 Thessalonians. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. So as this day should overtake you as a thief, you are all sons of the light and the light of the day. You're sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, drunk at night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet of hope for salvation. And then it would say, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation to our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So we must watch, and then we must be sober. Sober with what? Well, it says the breastplate of faith and love. We must make sure that we protect our heart. That's what the breastplate was for. We must protect our heart from allowing us to develop bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, so that we could not represent Jesus Christ well. That we couldn't join in a procession of parading God's salvation around a certain sinful city. We must protect our heart. And we also must protect our mind through the helmet of the hope of salvation. The way that we think, because there's so many attacks that are coming at us, so many things in which we might see on social media, on the media in general, that are constantly trying to tweak the way that we think. We must protect it with what? The hope of our salvation knowing that Jesus Christ must be at the center of everything that we may think. And by doing that, we fix our eyes on Christ. And that hope of salvation is so critical. Because as you walked in this place, may not expected to hear a message on the end times. But here's what I know we all need. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. I don't know what you've been facing, what you've been going through, what you've been dealing with, but he's coming soon. And there should be no greater thing that we should look forward to than we're face to face with our Lord. To be caught up in an instant, to be caught up in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye whether through life or through death. We know he's coming quickly. That in its own should take all of the hope and all of the affection in which we have for this world and place it on the thing to come. The day where our salvation is no longer by faith, but it now gets to be experienced by sight. What a blessing that moment shall be. So I don't know what you may have walked in here with. But you ought to walk out of here with a great sense of hope that Jesus Christ is coming. There is no greater way for us to have that at the center of our forefront than for us to take communion. For us to be able to come and and enjoy taking communion together. As we get to look at the very elements in which God has given us, our Savior Jesus has given us, as a way to remember what He's done for us. You see, when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus maybe caught up in the clouds, we will see a lamb who was slain. We will see Him as He was. A price heavily paid for our sin. Father, we thank You, Lord, 
that your word is true. It's alive and active, God. And, and as we look forward, I pray, God, that, that we, can, we can see you as we look backward as well. That in all things that you have shown us and displayed to us, the hope of our salvation, the ark of our salvation is only found in you. That as we place our faith and trust in you, God, may we be able to understand what that will maybe look like someday when we get to have our faith turned into sight. What a blessing that day will be. Father, we, like Rahab, have no clue about the timing. Don't know how you're going to work all these things out in its perfect picture. But we can't wait. May we be urgent with our sharing. And may we be sober-minded with our doing and our thinking. As we come forward to take of the communion, may you move our vision off of this world, off of the sin that may surround us or may even be entangling us, and place our hope firmly in the commander of the Lord's army, the captain of our salvation, you, Lord. We praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, and as we take communion,